But the idea of retiring and not having any responsibility and any expectation of contributing to your next door neighbor or your family or your children or to the whole world, uh, that, that's not a good way, that's not a good way to live. This is a podcast called Walk, Talk, Listen. An attempt to connect people and make this world a bit better by sharing opinions and experiences based on the belief that everyone's perspective is true, albeit partial. My name is Maurice Bloom, and I would like to welcome you to yet another episode of Walk, Talk. Okay, good day, everybody. This is another episode of the podcast Walk, Talk, Listen. And as always, I'm delighted with today's guest who will introduce himself. Ray Martin, please, please go ahead. Okay, well, what to say about myself? My name is Ray Martin. I grew up in Pennsylvania as a Mennonite farm boy. Some of you may know about the Amish in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Well, I grew up right in the midst of a farming area, very rich farming area of Lancaster County, surrounded by other farmers who were mostly, not all, but mostly Mennonites and Amish. My background is Mennonite. I went to a one-room school that served the rural population, the children of the farmers in the area. And we had eight grades in our little red brick schoolhouse and only one teacher. So imagine being a teacher responsible for eight grades and all the subjects Hmm. and fitting all those 30 or 35 people in my class, we were six people, only six, and um, earning a living by teaching all these, all these kids. But my father was very interested in missions. Uh, we grew up in a, you know, a pretty religious family. And uh, our Mennonite church sent missionaries to Africa and other places around the world. And although he had not had much experience traveling at all, he was very interested in global affairs because of his interest in missions Mm. and stories from missionaries traveling to faraway places uh, to talk about uh, faith and uh, their, their beliefs and that interest in missions and going to hear missionaries speak and show slides and show some of the, uh, the artifacts from the countries where they lived. That gave me a, uh, a, a desire to see more of the world. And so after, After high school and a couple years of college, I joined a voluntary service program of my church that sent me to East Africa, first to Somalia. And so I was only 21 years old. I was a young young lad going on the other side of the world. For me, it was the other side of the world. For Somalis, it's where they live, and uh, learning the Somali language, and then working in a uh, fairly remote, a very remote area where many of the people in the area were nomads. 
there weren't many people at all, but those who lived there, many of them were nomads. But along the rivers where there was water, there were a couple villages where people would settle down and learn how to farm. And my job was to work with people like that and help them uh, become more productive in their, uh, in their farming. And so that was a very exciting thing for me to be living in a uh, foreign culture and learn new foods, learn new languages, learn new customs, uh, learn new religious beliefs because Somalis, you probably know, are all, almost all Muslim. And for me, this, uh, this rather uh, uh, religious farm boy in a community where you didn't travel very much, this was a big and very exciting change for me. Hmm. And after a year and a half in Somalia, I went to Tanzania, what's now Tanzania, it was Tanganyika at that time, older Listeners might remember mm -hmm. that that East African country used to be called Tanganyika. And I spent a year and a half in Dar es Salaam, the capital, working for the Christian Council of Tanganyika, which is a collaboration among several of the Christian Protestant denominations in the country. And there I was in the capital city. So imagine being a farm boy living in a capital city where there's a, where the president of the country lives. And I saw a president for the first time, Julius Nyerere, president of uh, Tanganyika, and working in an office, which was uh, quite, different. I was working in the relief and service division of the Christian Council of Tanganyika, writing letters, going to meetings, and that was quite a contrast to uh, husking corn on the farm or, or uh, harvesting hay to put in the barn to feed the steers. So for me, this was a really different kind of life. And for me, it was a very exciting kind of life. Mm. So during those three years that you were uh, in Africa, in those two African countries, were your parents not worried? Did they not tell you to, you know, Ray, come back and go to school? No. Uh, in my case, no. And it was because my parents were so interested in missions that they were very, very happy that one of their children uh, chose to go far away. And in their mind, I was part of the missionary enterprise carrying the Christian gospel to people in Africa. And a, a, a story that illustrates my parents' attitude is that uh, later my youngest brother went to Vietnam as a volunteer. And he was there in 1975 when the North Vietnamese army and the Viet Cong uh, overpowered the southern Vietnamese army and all the Americans left, but he chose to stay because he wasn't there in support of the American cause related to the Vietnam War. And for a while, nobody knew where he was because communications had not, uh, weren't uh, very, very good. And the local newspaper interviewed my father and asked my father uh, whether they weren't worried about his safety, their son's safety. And his answer, which our family still talks about, 
was, and he was a man of deep faith, he said that the safest place to be is in the will of the Lord. <laughs> so oh. I, I was yeah. fortunate to have a, a father who mm -hmm. had that, uh, that attitude. And, and, and for yourself. So I understand, and thanks for that example. It's pretty amazing. But for yourself, when you went there, did you have the same feeling and the same view on this? Or was it more of an adventure for you than anything else? When I went there, I thought of myself as a missionary. Uh, I, I had a, a, a deep faith, and uh, I accepted the beliefs that I that I heard growing up, and so I I did feel as though I was there in the will of the Lord, and, and that wasn't inconsistent with uh, seeking adventure. So I felt both of those uh, both of those mm. motivations in what took me to uh, to Africa. Okay. So then, okay, uh, yeah, you went after, back, and then you went to school, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I finished college. I majored in economics. Mm. I graduated from a Mennonite college, Goshen College in Indiana, and then took one year of graduate school in economics at uh, Vanderbilt University in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and then joined USAID, the US wow. Agency for International yeah. Development is the foreign aid program, the development assistance program of the US government. And it, it comes under the State Department, mm -hmm. but uh, which is for non-Americans, think of a think of the State Department as our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, mm -hmm. and the the USAID or is somewhat uh, independent, but it does it is part of the United States foreign policy. And I had learned about USAID both in Somalia and in Tanganyika, where I saw people working and saw the activities of the uh, USAID missions in those countries. And it was that uh, three years in Africa under the Mennonites that uh, convinced me that I should pursue a career in international development. And I could have done that under the church also, but I chose to, to go the route of joining the foreign service. And and you did that work. You worked for USAID first within the U.S. or you went straight overseas. Well, we, uh, we had a uh, an orientation program mm -hmm. in Washington. So I moved to Washington, which was also exciting for me to be yeah. in the, the capital city mm -hmm. of my own country. Uh, so uh, we had uh, we interns. Uh, had uh, eight months of orientation and some, and working working in offices some of that time, and then went overseas. That was the the idea, and I was posted to uh, the North African country of Morocco because I spoke uh, I spoke some French. Morocco is a French speaking country. And so I had the good fortune of being uh, assigned to Morocco. Wow. And, and so for how many years did you work for USAID? Well, I worked for USAID for uh, 25 years. Hmm. And uh, it might be of interest to listeners to know that uh, I, I ask myself the, the question whether people, whether Christians, or let, let's say Christians of the particular variety that I was, you know, Christians with the Mennonite background, whether, whether we could actually uh, work for the U.S. government as a foreign service officer 
and do that and remain completely consistent with our own values and, and our own beliefs. Because Mennonites historically did not work for, for the governments. Mennonites were often persecuted back in their history. And in fact, uh, you know, I had ancestors who were several hundred years ago who were severely persecuted. Mm -hmm. So uh, we did not have a history of working for governments, but uh, things were changing and uh, I decided to try it. And, uh, and over time, uh, it, it worked out, although there was one time I was assigned to work in a, a USAID development program that was done in collaboration with the US Army. This was Vietnam in 1970. And uh, the Mennonites, most Mennonites were pacifists. And I did not like the idea of uh, working alongside US Army soldiers. And I said that I would not accept that assignment. Well, in the Foreign Service, you're supposed to go wherever you're assigned. And USAID actually threatened to fire me. Therefore, a, a, a year or so, I wasn't sure whether I would survive as a USAID officer. But in the end, they decided not to push, push me too hard. And they released me from that uh, Vietnam assignment. And, uh, and so I just stayed with USAID. And, and, and even now, even now I feel that, uh, although there may be some USAID policies or programs that I would disagree with, uh, in general, uh, I, am, I, I am happy to support the work of my, my own country's foreign aid program and then and also work in collaboration with, uh, with other countries in, in, in Canada. There's uh, Global Affairs Canada, the, the British, the French, uh, the Japanese. So many countries have their development assistance program, which is related to their foreign policies. And uh, although there are many mistakes made, if you look back over the years, uh, it, in general, I think these foreign aid programs of the rich countries have made significant contributions to improving the lives of people in Africa and Asia and Latin America. And Ray, if if um, but ultimately you you decide to to move on to uh, start to work somewhere else, right? Or yeah, and well, how did that I, happen? I I worked for a USAID for twenty five years, mm -hmm. and most of my assignments were in Africa. I, I've lived in six different African countries. Wow, I think I've traveled in thirty four African countries. Uh, after uh, 25 years, I was 52, and I had an opportunity to go to the World Bank, which uh, many of you know is an international development agency. It, it's not like a typical bank that you might think of. It's a development agency with headquarters in Washington, but working in, uh, in developing countries uh, all over the world. And so I always thought that working for the World Bank would be the, uh, you know, the, 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 the ultimate dream of somebody like me pursuing a career in international development. So I could not turn down this opportunity to work at the World Bank. Mm. So in the year 2000, about, now 1992, when I was uh, 52 years old, I uh, left USAID 
and became a public health specialist for the World Bank, living in Washington, but traveling frequently to the French speaking African countries to work on uh, health programs that the World Bank was financing. And so that was, that was exciting too. And that took me to, to many more countries. Uh, Career-wise, uh, I, when I was working for the World Bank, heard about an organization that began in the United States, although now it's global, and it's called Christian Connections for International Health, or CCIH. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, CCIH is a network of. Uh, Christian organizations and individuals working in developing countries uh, in the public health and nutrition and reproductive health area. And it's a network with members. One of the members is uh, an organization that I had heard about and knew about called Church World Service. They were one of our members and many of the major uh, denominational mission programs, development programs were members of our network. Mm. And uh, I am something of a networker, I guess, mm-hmm. a connector. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I enjoy uh, getting people to work together. Uh, you probably heard of the, uh, the African proverb that if you want to go fast, go by yourself. Mm-hmm. You want to go far, walk with others mm. well i i choose to i want to go far yeah and to collaborate with other people so i mm-hmm. eventually became a board member and then eventually the executive director for 14 years i was executive director of this network of christian well, 14 one, one four okay wow one, one four years yes and then in uh, finally in two i At age 74, Mm -hmm. which was uh, 2014, I stepped down as executive director and sort of retired. Mm -hmm. But uh, growing up uh, on the farm, the values that we (laughs) that were part of our culture uh, just weren't compatible with somebody who wanted to sit around and listen to music or watch TV (laughs) all the time. (laughs) And so I got very involved in climate change. Mm. And that's where I am now. I'm 81 years old. But uh, yeah, I I don't have to get up and go to an office at uh, eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. But I am very deeply involved in, uh, in the issue of climate change because I believe that if, if we don't uh, learn how to live on the planet Earth in a more sustainable, mm-hmm. uh, less demanding, less polluting manner, we're going to be leaving our children, my children, I have two children, and I have two grandchildren. Mm. And I care about everybody's children and grandchildren. And so I decided that in my old age, I'm going to uh, spend quite a bit of time and quite a bit of money. I save money and I'm mm-hmm. using some of the money that I've to saved yeah. to support programs that address the uh, what many people would call the existential issue mm. of climate change. And and do you do that through a different type of organizations or through supporting a network? Are you still on the board somewhere, or how do you do that? Well, yes, some of some of everything. Hmm. Uh, I I I'm involved with a, a local group in uh, Fairfax County, Virginia, where mm-hmm. I live. That's called the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions. And we're working with our uh, county supervisors to uh, adopt more uh, 
friendly, environmentally friendly policies. Mm -hmm. And we've had quite a bit of impact, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm involved. In fact, tomorrow morning, I'm having breakfast with the founder and organization of Eco America, which is a fairly sizable organization, U.S. organization focused on climate change. In, they have a health division and they have a uh, faith division also called Blessed Tomorrow. And then tomorrow lunch, I'm having, I'm having lunch <laughs> with the founder and president of the board of this Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions. Mm. And just yesterday, I had a Zoom call with the president of Eastern Mennonite University. Uh, because I'm working with them in a mm. very, very large project focused on Mennonites and climate change. And I gave, um, I'd saved a lot of money mm. and, and pledged a million dollars to this effort. Wow, that's, that's amazing. And so uh, we're, we're trying to move the needle mm -hmm. using that expression among Mennonites but, and other people of faith also uh, to become more, more uh, aware and more concerned mm -hmm. and uh, undertaking serious action and changes that would, uh, that would uh, reduce the risk of uh, very catastrophic consequences from our present uh, lifestyle which and our economy which re relies so much on carbon you know oil and gas and coal so uh, i'm trying to be part of the process of uh trying to help our society to adapt to the kind of world that won't create big problems for our children and grandchildren Well, wow, that's that's yeah. Well, I would like to applaud you for that. That's that's really uh, great and and very important. I mean, you know, for the listeners, uh, well, they know that or very often we talk in this podcast about climate change and what what I'm always enthusiastic about is that that many of my guests, um, you know, if I ask them about the the hope that they still have despite worries is that the younger generation is really uh, very often uh, very concerned about uh, our climate and you know trying to right. to do something about it but i think it's equally important that you know the more senior uh, citizens in our uh, world you know are are still doing the same so that's yeah a lot of kudos and thank you so much for for what you do um ray what what i wanted to to uh, ask you is well, you, you know that, uh, you know, I, I uh, have just finished my 10th uh, 100 mile um, to raise awareness about and funds for um, to end hunger, poverty and injustice. If you would be asked to walk 100 mile in a week, and I, we talked about a little bit, you're still walking. That is really impressive. Um, if you would be asked to walk for a cause, for which cause would you do it? Is that climate change, or 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 would it be something else? Um, I I actually do a lot of walking. <laughs> when, for my 80th birthday, I organized a couple walks hmm. uh, of eight miles, yeah. which, but in one day. Uh, mm -hmm. The idea being uh, walk one mile for each decade of my life. Wow, and. Uh, and each year now, I do walk a half marathon, two half marathons in one day. Uh, I, I can still do it. It took me, it took me almost four hours to mm. walk a half marathon in uh, September. Yeah. But I was still alive and feeling tired, of course, but not, not too bad. So I, if, but, uh, 
if if I were walking for a cause, and I, I have walked, uh, there used to be, I don't know whether they still have crop walks, but maybe maybe that it is still exists. Walks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that that is church world service. Yes, that's us. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's yeah. I, I've I've walked, uh, but it's a long time ago. I've mm -hmm. walked in in crop walks. I think for a cause uh, right now, if I organize something for myself. Uh, I would probably uh, build it around the theme of uh, sustainability mm -hmm. and environmental justice yeah. and climate change. Hmm. But uh, a walk that would be, uh, that had a theme that was more generally just uh, addressing poverty, mm -hmm. that, that would motivate me. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, Ray, you know, I, I don't know if, if you put an alarm clock or you wake up by yourself. I always have to put an alarm clock, otherwise I will sleep, you know, continue to sleep the whole day. Um, but but uh, yeah, what, what makes it uh, that you wake up in the morning, you stand up and you think, you know, this is, yeah, what drives you in life? I, I'm a, I grew up in the post-World War II Area. I was born in 1940, so I lived during World War II, but I was a, a baby or a little boy and don't really remember it. But then in the time uh, as I began to grow older and, and more aware, uh, it was a period in the United States of recovery and growth after the, that uh, devastating war. And uh, I grew up with sort of the feeling that uh, if we tried, we being all of us, if we tried, life would get better and better. And we would, uh, through science, find new opportunities and new solutions to medical problems, to, you know, all aspects of uh, human life. And so I grew up with uh, this sort of philosophy or this belief that we could make life better for ourselves and for everyone else. And uh, I think that uh, that that idea is still with me, although some some days reading the newspaper it's really hard to think that things are getting better and better. But I still have something of that idealism in me. And uh, so waking up in the morning and thinking of what I'll do for the day that will make the world a better place makes, makes me look forward to the day and and motivates me to to uh, be active in whatever whatever I'm doing. So I I I think that for me it's important to have the the feeling that I am not living for myself. Mm. That uh, I'm I'm called and I I do have the feeling of uh, that there's sort of a calling. There is a, there's a life that each of us is invited to live that, uh, that connects you, connects oneself with all of humanity and, and the whole, the whole world. And so the, uh, the, if you if you're living in that if you're living in that uh, that belief that you have a purpose that there's a purpose in life for you and for some people for many people and I would say for with me to a certain extent that may relate to faith and spirituality and mm -hmm. religion. Uh, 
however you have that feeling of purpose, that you're not here just randomly mm -hmm. or accidentally, and that you're uh, that you're not called just to live a selfish life, uh, to indulge in your own whatever tempts you, whatever you enjoy, without uh, consideration of how it impacts on other people. I think, uh, at least for me, I'm convinced that having that sense of purpose makes it uh, a, a good experience to wake up in the morning and look forward to a day of activities that is going to uh, uh, further that purpose. That, that doesn't mean that you can't have fun. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, uh, for me, working at these activities that I think will uh, help somebody out, for me, that is fun. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I do things just for, for pleasure sometimes, but uh, I, I, I have to be very, um, very emphatic in saying that, uh, I, to me, it's important to have a sense of purpose. And even the idea of retirement is, uh, is sort of, you can define retirement in different ways, but the idea of retiring and not having any responsibility or any, uh, and any expectation of contributing to your next door neighbor or your family or your children or to the whole world, uh, that, that's not a good way, that's not a good way to live. And so for me, I, I like getting up in the morning and uh, looking at, well, what do I have to do today? Oh, today I'm going to be interviewed by Maurice. Well, that's great. <laughs> and, and Ray, um, you know, the ray that that uh, was born um you know among this mennonite well and and then surrounded by the amish as well that went to africa did at that time did you um yeah, did you look at at things differently in relation to faith and spirituality and purpose or was that you know, is that, or or did that remain more or less the same over the, over uh, over your life? Well, I'll, I'll be over honest. The course of your life. That, yeah, I'll be honest that it's it's not exactly the same. I guess I would say in some ways it's the same or similar, uh, but in other ways it's quite different. Because I, I grew up, uh, I grew up in a very closed environment and we went to church and you know everybody around me was or just about everybody around me uh considered themselves christian they weren't all mennonites a lot were mennonites and amish but not all uh but then i went to somalia when i was 21 and somalis are about 99 percent muslim so here I was, a, a young Christian boy living in a, a remote village in Somalia where all the other people in the village were Muslims. And I observed how, how those uh, parents taught their children what to believe and brought up their children to be good Muslims. And of course, that made me think about myself. Uh, is Christianity or my version of Christianity the only right way? Uh, I had to begin to w wonder whether the reason that I believed what I believed 
and the kind of Christian that I was, the kind of Mennonite that I was, was uh, not necessarily because that's the only good way to, to think or to believe, uh, but maybe, maybe one way along with other ways. And so uh, I, it was a, it was a very difficult uh, transition for me to go from the kind of sort of narrow beliefs that I grew up with to where I am now, mm. where, where I have a great deal of respect for people from many different uh, faith traditions. And so, so now I, I still call myself a Christian, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not the kind of Christian that would argue that the only good way to live is the Christian way. Mm. So, uh, so for me, having lived in other cultures and of course read and learned about uh, other cultures and other religions and other faiths, other faith, faiths, other spiritualities has, I think, broadened me and my views about uh, the world and truth and, uh, and reality. You know, talking about faith, um, what do you see among the younger generation with regard to religion, spirituality? Is that similar, um, you know, to how you and your generation looked at religion and spirituality and how they experienced that? Or has that changed? And, and, and if so, how? What, what do you see? What do you, do you observe? Yeah. Well, I... Uh... I don't profess to have any special insight or religion or, uh, or insight or understanding better than anybody else. But I, I do see that uh, here in the United States at least, and that, that, may, that may not be true of everywhere, say in Africa, but here in the, in the country that I live in, uh, people generally are not as tightly attached to one particular belief system or, or uh, religion. In fact, uh, surveys, many of you probably know, surveys in the United States show that uh, the percentage of people who identify as one particular religion uh, over time is declining quite, quite a bit. And uh, there are many people who will call themselves spiritual, but not religious, <laughs> mm. meaning mm. that they, they feel that there is something beyond just the physical dimensions of living. And so they, they would call themselves spiritual but they're, they're not religious in the sense that they're tied to any particular religion or church or denomination. And I, uh, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Uh, what, I, what I think is bad is people who claim that life is only physical, it's only biology and chemistry. And uh, I had a strong science background in school, so I'm a big believer in science and chemistry <laughs> and biology and physics. But uh, for me, I can make more sense out of life. And I think I'm happier because I, I do feel that there is a spiritual dimension of life that uh, one should cultivate 
and pay attention to. And so I, uh, I, I don't mind when young people say that they're spiritual, but not religious. But I still think it's, it's important to be a part of a community of other people who are also uh, sh share, share that same uh, point of view, that same kind of thinking. Mm. Life, I, I, I'm sure, is, is more meaningful when you're in community with other people mm. who practice and believe the way, the way you do. So as I say, I, young people being spiritual but not religious is okay, but I'm a little bit worried when young people choose not to associate with any community of uh, people who share their values and their belief system. So I, I uh, but, but, uh, but I don't think, I don't think it, uh, whatever that community, there can be a wide variety of experience and religious practice in various communities. But I, I think it's important to belong, to feel as though you belong somewhere. Okay. Um. Yeah, I would like to bring you some somewhere else because I, I really, you know, music uh, means a lot. It's very important in my life. I listen to a lot of music, different types. Um, so I would like to ask you, if if I ask you to mention a song or a piece of music that, that embodies what you are about, or at least for a big part, uh, which song or piece of music would that be? Well... <laughs> I, I like most kinds of music. I'm not a big fan of jazz mm. for some reason, but I like classical music. I like country music. I like pop music. I mm. like gospel music. Uh, the one, one song that comes to my mind when you ask that question mm -hmm. is that uh, uh, the title is something about dancing. Uh, I hope you dance. But but the song goes that uh, if you're if you have the choice to dance or to not to dance to stay on the sidelines and just watch, I hope you dance. It, it was a very popular song maybe uh, fifteen years ago, and I've often I've told people sometimes that this expressed my philosophy mm. that if you uh, if, if you if you have the choice of being active going out and doing things adopting a cause mm -hmm. to work for and and give your uh, your your time and effort and energy to that cause uh or if you have the if the other choice is just to sort of sit back and and try to uh, enjoy life with with no with no objective or no cause mm -hmm. to work for, then I, I hope that you choose to dance. That's the a song sang by Lee and Womack. Yes, yes, that's that's the one. That's yeah. the one. Okay, I hope I, you dance. No, I, I'm quickly, you know, scanning the lyrics, what you were explaining to me. And it, it seems indeed that you could have written the lyrics. So, I, I, uh, <laughs> you know, when I listen to you uh, today. So great. I, I, you know, just a reminder for, for the listeners. I, um, I've made on Spotify a, a, a playlist of all the songs that are that have been picked by my uh, guests. So you find there, you know, you, your song will be there uh, soon as well. You find there jazz as well, um, heavy metal, classical music, you know, a whole wide range of, of songs and pieces of music that, uh, well, embodies all the, embody together 
all the guests that I've had uh, for this particular podcast. So, so thanks for, for sharing. Uh, okay. that's, that's, that's awesome. Um, you know, it always goes very fast. Um, so I am actually, I come to the last question with you. And that is uh, any message, invitation or question for the listeners from you. Oh, um, this, this is a very difficult time for us Americans. Uh, I don't remember any time in my life, my 81 years, when our country was divided uh, as sharply as it is now. And it's, it's very sad to me that uh, we seem to be taking sides and uh, stick with our side so strongly that we uh, don't even want to uh, interact with people who think differently than we do. And surveys have shown that among Americans, uh, Americans who are liberal, who would call themselves liberal, often have no friends who uh, call themselves conservative. And people who are conservative associate with others conservatives and don't interact with people who consider themselves liberal or progressive. So I, I guess I would ask, I would ask ourselves, I mean, I, I, I have to ask that to myself, and I would hope that all of us would ask of ourselves whether that kind of mentality where we stick so strictly, so strongly to one point of view, and uh, are not open to trying to understand other points of view, whether that is really the kind of country, the kind of society, or the kind of community that we want to live in. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that would be one overarching question that I would ask of myself and all of us whether whether we really want to continue uh, the way we are now, mm. and, and I, I hope I hope that the answer would be uh, we we need to change our uh, mentality, our our thinking a little bit, uh, and uh, that doesn't mean that we have to agree with points of view that we don't agree with, but we have to be more open to appreciating and understanding a, a variety of, of beliefs and points of view and uh, seriously seek to uh, get along with people who share different views than we do. That, uh, and I, I'll tell you, I, I, you know, I mentioned earlier that I grew up with sort of the idea that the world was getting a better and better place. And if we worked at it through uh, mutual understanding, through science, through knowledge, through learning, that we could make the world a better place for ourselves and our children and grandchildren. And now when I see some of these uh, tendencies and trends that are actually separating us from one another, and tearing us apart, I I would like to challenge all of us, myself included, to uh, to think about to think about that, and uh, and and work toward something that uh, well, what Martin Luther King called the beloved community, where we don't all have to think alike but we should think of ourselves as all part of the same. Thank you for that, uh, Ray. And, and um, well, it, it's, it's almost that, that uh, 
yeah i'm so thankful for for your you know that question or raising this um because one well maybe the main reason for for me in doing this podcast is to you know to show people that um yeah you have more there is always um well every perspective is true but partial and if you if you if you consider that as a as a correct statement you you always have the possibility to start a dialogue because nobody can be wrong all the time so yeah <laughs> um so you know and that that opens an enormous opportunity to make this world a little bit better and and uh, so listening is is an important part of that so i would like to thank you so much for for uh, your willingness to speak with me today i i really enjoyed it and and for the listeners it is really amazing what what ray was willing to do because i i called him this morning um because it was somebody that that dropped out of of uh, because of an, an illness so i was like oh, tomorrow the podcast needs to go out so what should i do so so ray was so kind to to uh, to say yes i would like to talk with you that we can do that so thank you so much for um sharing your experiences um yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I'm sure the listeners did as well. So thank you so much. And, and uh, thank you for everything you still do. It's amazing and very important. So, uh, Well, I, 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 I wish I could identify and uh, talk to and listen to all the people that uh, tune into your podcast. Hmm. Yeah. So I, I suppose there are people all over the world, probably people in many countries I've mm -hmm. been to, so it's uh, it's uh, been fun for me to share this way through you, Maurice. Yeah. And of course, I'll never be able to connect with all of you, but I wish I could. Yeah. No. I mean, you know, I, that's a good good um, reminder, actually. And and lately, some people have been doing that. You can leave comments. Well, if you go below the podcast, you, you there is a possibility to react, to like it, but also to leave a comment. So I would always. Oh. Uh -huh. encourage people to do so and um in the the notes of the podcast i i uh, i left my email so you can always send emails to me and i can forward uh you know those to to ray as well if you, if you want to ask him more so um yeah thank you uh, ray and and uh yeah it was great it was my thank pleasure. you so much my pleasure Thank you for listening to Walk, Talk, Listen. Please check us out on 100mile.org or follow us on Facebook or Instagram. I just finished the 10th 100 mile walk and I really encourage you to check out our website 100mile.org to see how you can still contribute to this campaign. Thank you.